say anything. I think the more the tension rises, the more people just get um, more crazy and they start to fall back on an answer that isn't sufficient. You've seen a lot of violence. I've seen a lot of violence in my life, not not murder and stuff or, or death the way you have in war, um, but just working in bars and rough bars when I was a young man. I've, it, it, there's an effect that violence has on consciousness, okay? People people kind of go into shock. I'm seeing evidence of shock and, and, and trauma-induced incoherence in people now. And, I, and look, I don't want to pick on anyone. I don't want to name names, but it's, you know, now that I've opened up this can of worms, I'll get into it. The first person I saw it in that really drew it out for me was Nighthawk himself. This is about six or seven months ago. He comes on a round table, sneaking in the back door the way he does. He doesn't have to call in. He just sort of popped onto the round table, which is fine. It's his station. And he does this elaborate trashing of Deborah Tavares. So I, I don't know if we can trust her. I don't know if her information is good. I want to let everybody know there's a chat forum up there. Some guy sent me some emails pointing out all of her errors. And Deborah Tavares is one of the most credible people ever to come on to alternative radio. Like absolute diehard researcher. She may make an error here and there. Don't forget that most people who present research publicly, they're funded. They get grants. They have assistance. And here I'm talking about academe think tanks like the Council on Foreign Relations I'm going to get to later in the show. Deborah Tavares is one person doing all of this research and having to come up with the money to keep a roof over her head, feed herself, take care of herself in retirement. People don't understand the amount of work that goes into some of these people who are present in in alternative media. But that was, and I'm not, and, and Hawk, if you're listening, I love you, man, and thank God for Revolution Radio, but that was really weird what you did that night. Really weird. And then if you're listening to the roundtables now, and even sometimes it spills out even onto some shows, there's a lot of, there's conflict everywhere now. Big John called it, didn't he? I can't remember if that was in an off-air conversation with you or me or on-air. But it's just, it's, John, it's almost like the devil's been loosed in the world. It's like everywhere you look, there's conflict. Well, we'll get back to that, you know. I speak my truth. This is an open forum, a public space. I'm standing here. If you want to debate with me, if you want to come on a roundtable, come on in. Call. Don't go on somebody else's roundtable and say, Bruce this, Bruce that. I'm standing right here. You have a problem with me, call in. Okay? I've been trying to solve this Tony Why Not thing for a year and a half. Every time I try and call in to his roundtable and I space it out, like every three months I'll give it another try, he mocks me on air for calling in. Doesn't want to resolve the problem. Doesn't want to talk it out. You know, I got, I got, I got, I, I got uh, I, you know, the, the, the night Viking and I gave a more, I would, I would call it a higher consciousness perspective on two feathers problem. All right. About solving your problem, becoming more independent, stop expecting other people to, to take care of you. You're being very naive and spiritually, a, a spiritual person is autonomous. Well, I mean, he's just running around to other... He's still having that debate on other roundtables in the absence of Viking Indy. My name coming up, Viking's name coming up. Come on, folks, what's going on here? If you got something to say, say it to the person's face. Don't be a coward, right? So this tension is getting out of control. And let's be... There's some people that are very difficult to deal with. The hijacker has the most suited name on the station because... His tone and aggression literally take over any conversation. Yeah. You, and I, you, were, you and I were doing a brilliant two-person think tank roundtable eight days ago on a Thursday night with a piece of information that was fresh off the presses, the release of the Phoenix office's FBI memo, prima facie evidence that the deep state is alive and well, talking about laboring, labeling conspiracy theorists, terrorists, and you and I were going really deep into the ramifications of that. We're examining the National Defense Authorization Act. We're putting together years of being in this alternative community in an intelligent and coherent way. Second hour, shouting, screaming, and, and we're back to flat earth and, and the Nephilim. Okay? Like, I don't know what's going on here, right? I, I you know, uh, people I, are... I think, I think uh, people... Have... Let, me finish, let me finish. Let me finish. One more thing, okay? The two to four, the two to four slot completely died for six months. 
There was no revolution radio from two in the morning till four in the morning. I decided to see if I could resurrect it. And many of those shows, I picked up a server and I would talk alone for two hours. I would do counsel on foreign relations articles. I would give my perspective on things. Then people started calling in. And then we started to get little core groups of two or three people. The conversations became better. Then more people came in. And now I'm hearing, you know, Bruce's ego is out of control. He's on the radio all the time. Okay, so who's going to step up and commit to these roundtables? Who wants Thursday? Who wants, I'll keep the olive branch and my Sunday night and that's it. Who wants Sunday night from two to four? Who wants uh, Thursday night from two to four? Who wants Friday night from two to four? And who wants Sunday night from two to four? There are four open roundtables I'm about to give up. If I walk away from those roundtables, it'll be dead air. Somebody might pick it up and do two or three weeks in a row and then they'll quit because they don't have the discipline. They don't have the commitment. Right? Or they they really don't have the energy or the intelligence to carry a two-hour show. It's, you just, you just it's, repetition, repetition, repetition. Nephilim, God, Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and it's just ridiculous. Right? It's absolutely ridiculous. So I'm calling out anyone who has a problem. Anybody who has a problem. Call in. Tell me what your problem is, okay? Talk it out. Talk it out. That's what the roundtables are for. There, I've said this numerous times, okay? Conflict is a beneficial thing. It's actually the principal learning tool God created for this reality, this physical reality we live in. Conflict is a brilliant learning tool. It has to be done honorably. It was so well respected that the Greeks, who are the foundation of the society we're still living in, by the way, the thought containers and the... Debate containers we live in as a Western society that produces that produced all of our truth and all of our rationality and all of our good perspective came from the Greeks. It came from debate. The Greeks valued debate. Okay? They call it a dialectic. Dia dia meaning to Jim, I'll bring in oh sorry, SJ, I'll bring you in, in a in a bit, okay? I'm just gonna do this thing for the first hour and um I'll bring you in, in a bit, okay? He's, um, SJ's calling from BC. Okay. Now, they created rules. The Greeks created rules to a debate. That you had to debate about the subject only. And in Greek society and in, in the Greek intelligentsia, and the intelligentsia is the intellectuals, I guess you would call them, um, you were considered to have lost the debate the moment you attacked the other person's character because you left the subject of the debate. Do you follow, John? Oh, yeah, no, it makes perfect sense um, why that's not the case today. <laughs> yeah, and this is what I'm, it's, it's like there's a complete and total breakdown of rationality. What did you mean, what did you, when, when you, you got a little excited there when I said it seems like the devil's in the world. I've never known you to be a religious guy. Why did that key you off? Oh, it just, it just is. It's, it's a true statement. Um, I think it's taken a little bit, uh, I think it's taken some time to, um, um, cool or I, I really don't know the, I don't have the word here let's just say it took a while for it to come about right? um, especially since I would say the mid, mid 2000s um, it's taken a while and now it's gotten to this point where it just kind of permeates everything around us it's just like stuff certain things are just like soaked in this you know yeah well and I'll tell you in the background I'm getting all kinds of tech, text messages all kinds of crazy stuff, okay? People are getting teed off. I, I, okay. think, I think one of the interesting things yeah. you brought up was conflict. And people nowadays, um, you know, this is why I find it so interesting, is because back in the day, even when I was a kid, you were still taught by your parents, you know, if someone hits you and they're bigger, you know, pick up a stick and hit them back. You know, it's not yeah. like that nowadays. And I find a very interesting parallel between the new generation and adults from the old generation because a lot of them have converted to this non-conflict conflict path. I, I don't have the word well, there, sorry. Well, if you want to character, here's an interesting thing. If you want to characterize violence, why is it so horrible to lose your temper and punch someone in the nose or in the jaw? And they're okay. They, they don't need to go to the hospital or anything. It's not. Well, I mean, okay. No, but okay. Why, why, why is that so vilified? 
But a group of angry lesbians or social justice warriors can literally ruin a man's life, cost him his job, send him to the gutter and commit suicide and say he got what he deserved and still maintain their nonviolent people. Yeah, that's that's a little ridiculous. I mean, absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, like the way the way we ridiculous. we dealt the way we dealt with things in the military, you know, like if if you crash, if I let you borrow my motorcycle and you know you total it, and you tell me at a bar, and right, I'll be like, all right, come outside, all right, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna hit you, I'll help him up afterward, and then I'll buy the guy, I'll get him drunk, you know, and then that's it, you know, it's over. All right, it's a bike, whatever. So in, in, independent of theology or references to to theological entities like the devil. What do you think is going on in the world? Because you've, you've been around a lot of violence. You've, you've, yeah. seen, you've seen what human beings, both soldiers and civilians, are like around violence. What I'm seeing now around me, John, is like there's an old, there's an old saying for Bush people in Canada. I used to have some prospector friends, and they would actually work for big, big um, gold mining companies, and they would be hired to go and stake claims. It's a it's a formal process, and you got to you got to take a tent and a gun, and and you get flown in by a helicopter, and you got to live in the woods for three months, and you got to you got to walk like a few hundred kilometers in snowshoes. You have to tie all these ribbons to trees. You have to do it with a compass. You can it's only like a square kilometer is one claim, and and you have to nail in these metal tacks, these metal plaques on the tree. And then you have to photograph everything with your camera. Or in the old days, you had to take a Polaroid and photo. Or the Ministry of Natural Resources would go out and check one or two of them. If you're registering 100, they would go out and check one or two of them to see. And then they say, yeah, he, we're going to believe that he staked all the rest of them. And um, and then um, um, they, they used to have this saying, these bush guys, I know. Because you, you see, when you go that deep in the bush alone, you're going to have some encounters with nature. And these guys used to tell me, no matter how brave you think you are, if you're in British Columbia and you come up against a 1,500-pound grizzly bear, a brown bear, a Kodiak, your knees are going to lock involuntarily. It's like your body's been taken over. Your knees are going to lock, you're going to wet your pants, and you're going to shit your pants. And that is the ultimate human response to like absolute terror and fear. And what I'm seeing now is I'm seeing so we're if if that's the final stage, I'd say we're three or four stages away from that now, and nobody's crapping their pants yet, but they're they're not thinking right. Everybody's no, all. Not. So you're seeing this too? Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I think I think one of the one of the things about how much conflict or how much violence, and now let's let's be honest, there's different sorts of conflict and there's different sorts of violence. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, like you have domestic abuse, spousal abuse that goes back and forth, you know, yeah, yeah. stuff like that. But um, one of the most interesting things that I've seen is that people have seen real violence or had it done to them. Right. Um, it, don't get me wrong. It's it's a lonely and a long road to hoe. But at the end, they realize something at the end of it. And yeah. I would imagine it's different for each person. But without seeing whatever that was. And, and, you know, processing it for however long it takes you to get through that trauma. Um, you know, the, I guess what I'm saying is you can't continue to be that person that has, that has been affected by that trauma in such a way where it's detrimental to your health. That's where conflict resolution comes into play. So why do you think you and I are immune to it? I'm not losing my shit. I'm getting calmer. I don't, and I don't think. I don't think we're. I only lose my shit when I'm doing, dealing with a complete idiot on a round table. I don't think we're immune to it because we've gone through it. Uh, well, that's, the, that's the what best, we're, we're inoculated. Yeah, there we go. Okay, and and also I, you know, I set myself apart. You got all these Bible guys here saying the end is nigh, and I'm not even a Christian. And I took the remedy from that book. When you see these signs in society, set yourself apart. And I'm peaceful and I'm happy. And they're the Christians, and they haven't done it. Like you got to shake your head and go, "What's going on?" It's like they don't even believe their own religion. Um, it also has to do with letting go, right? Yes. Um, yeah. that's, uh, I guess, it, it, yeah, you can consider it part of a spiritual life, but, you know, if you're in such a situation where you can't hold on to grudges because of business or whatever type of work you're doing, kind of like what I was doing back then, um, yeah. you really, you really didn't have time to dwell on those grudges because at the end of the day, you might find yourself with that person again, you know, back to back. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. So, yeah, pe- but, you know, people, 
the tension is just rising and rising and rising. And it's not going anywhere. And segueing into tonight's topic, because this is a topic-based roundtable, it's about white supremacy and um, these sorts of things. Um, I've been saying I caught on early on to the Jewish presence in the Trump campaign. Now, let me I want to be really clear. And this is why I don't like a lot. You know, when you want to make yourself clear, you can't you can't have seven or nine people on a roundtable. We'll open it up in the second hour. Hijacker, I'm going to bring you in in the second hour. OK, just just let John and I do this first hour. I've got some. um, um Rectify. We can't all afford it, banker. I worked as an IT contractor for three years at a bank, Rectify. I'm not a banker. Okay? We can't, we can't all afford it. And maybe if you didn't do crystal meth for a decade, you might have some money saved and you'd be in a position to help yourself. It's tough love time. I'm taking the kid's glove, kid gloves off with these idiots. I've had it. I've had it. If I get kicked off the station, I, get, I, I really don't care anymore, John. Oh, oh, Jack, I really don't now, care. You might, you might break your left hand again. Easy. <laughs> I really don't care anymore. OK, I'm going to speak my truth and I'm going to call people out for their bullshit. A lot of jealous, jealous people is basically what's going on. A lot of jealous. And now they realize it's really happening. It wasn't just something to talk about on the radio in 2013 to give yourself a little drama you weren't getting from HBO. People have layers inside of them, right? It's like the first level of cog. You learn this meditating. You start to get hints about something. It'll come in dreams and it'll come in meditation and it'll come pictographically. Human consciousness, uh, linguistics and the use of our tongues and breath to create language is the most, the crudest form of language. Okay. The second, high, the next form of language is pictographic, except it's not quite like Carl Jung said. Carl Jung was a Kabbalist and deeply influenced by it and misled by it. Um, it's, th- th- there, is, there is some universal symbolism. But the deeper consciousness will uh, will speak to individuals on an individual basis. So I have a I have a recurring figure in my dreams. It's a guy I go I, it's a guy I go back to grade four uh, with, and I haven't known him for like thirty five thirty seven years. And um, but he 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 he's emblematic of something in my consciousness. The nade it's not that the crow or the bear or the wolf are universal symbols. Those th- those were exter- those were external things that the spirit worked with natives because it was part of their external world. You, you see where I'm going with this? So that you'll start you'll start to get things internally first, and then you get what I call tie offs. And another name for a tie-off, you can get really hard tie-offs that are almost like a miracle. It's like if you were to put a team of statisticians on this from Yale University, they would come back with a probability matrix of a trillion to one for what you described happening ha- happened. And another lesser form is synchronicity. A lot of new age type people make a big deal out of that. Synchronicity is not a big, big thing, although it is, you, sh- you should pay attention to them because um, anytime there's a crossroads between the internal and external life, I would say that's a, that's a point in which spirit is trying to speak to you. So you want to pay attention to it. But what I'm, what I'm realizing is um, um, pe- people, can, people can get, everybody gets it, John, is what I'm saying. It's just the rest is the ability to act on it, the, 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 the ability to actually have the courage to go out and act on it. And it's funny because most people can't, okay? You know, and, and like... Uh, you know, when I listen to some of the characterizations that have been said about me, like what Rectify just commented, we can't all afford it, banker. OK, and then and then two feathers with the silver spoon comment last week. You know, my life story, John, how in the world could people how, hold on, let me ask my question? How in the world could people possibly project that stereotype on me? They can't because they're making assumptions. But okay. what, where does it come from? Jealousy. Um, envy. Uh, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe it's something they wish they could do. I mean, you know, like uh, I'll tell you right now, like you know what my fantasy is: cabin in the woods. That's my fantasy. New Jersey, pine barrens. <laughs> I don't know about New Jersey. I don't know. Somewhere a little further out, but um, no, I mean, like where you came from, dude. Like, it's funny. It's it's. It's almost like the people that have, like, you know, uh, climbed that bottom rung. You know, they started at literally the bottom rung one way or another. And, and have then, gotten, yeah. gotten to a point, you know, where they've set out to do what they're, what, 
you know, whatever it's led to, whatever, you know, it is they want to do. It's like, well, now people feel like, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, you know, this or that happened to me. And, and, and they're still they're still holding on to something ultimately is what it is. You know, the whole thing about yeah. letting go comes back into play. Yeah. And so um, I agree. And um, th- this idea of entitlement and materialism is sometimes affixed to me. Why not started that? Now, in truth, when I met Why Not for a brief period, for six weeks, I was working two contracts and making about $22,000 a month. Now, that's the most money I've ever made. But don't forget, folks, at that level of income, you, I lose 55, 60% of that to taxes. I act, I'm the guy that pays the taxes that allows someone like Why Not to live on welfare and disability for 35 years. Okay? And, then, and that's something you've got to recognize. If you're, you, know, you, you don't keep all that money. Okay? But I, I absolutely promise you, Probably 90% of the people involved in Rev Radio, if you were to add up all the equity they have in the world, whether it's a home they're going to inherit or the bank, they, they, the money they have in the bank, or I'm probably, on, a, on paper, I'm probably one of the poorest people at Revolution Radio. I don't have a lot of money. I get money when I need it. I'll be down to like $300 in my bank account. Tell them my girlfriend, go, you know, go, go easy at the grocery store, man. I don't know when my next uh, impromptu tech writing contract is coming from. Or content writing is a big thing these days. They call it SEO writing, search engine optimization. And then, you know, the grace of spirit gives me another contract. I make another 1200 bucks, and I'll live on that for six, eight weeks, 600 bucks a month. And yet I have to listen to this shit like I'm silver spoon, entitled, all this, all the, all this bullshit. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, hey, it's funny because... People treat me the way jealous black and Hispanic people treat white people in general. I'm like Richie Rich at Rev Radio. You know, I'll say one other thing on this topic before we get head on into the CFR, because I don't want to turn the whole roundtable into a poor Bruce roundtable. Um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. What the hell was I going to say? Um, yeah, okay. I, I, I can't quite remember. But um, it, it just, what happens is, another thing that happens is, if people have accepted a dogma as a way of living, and a religion is a dogma, it's not a living doctrine, it's not a, it's not a spiritually vital spring coming through your consciousness, okay? Sorry, folks. You, 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 you know, and the worst of them all are salvation doctrines. And the problem with a salvation doctrine is it makes you spiritually lazy and you don't do the work. You don't meditate, you don't fast, and you don't pray. And you don't keep seeking because you think you have all the answers already, right? If you study the history of great spiritual figures in the human race... They come out of nowhere, John. Now, they'll, in the beginning, they'll start and study with a few teachers in various schools, and they'll move around. They'll move around. They'll learn something from this guy in northern India. Then, then, then they'll walk 2,000 kilometers and visit China in the 4th century AD and learn some of Taoism and stuff like this. And, but they're really, they're really independent. They don't, they don't rest on any final doctrine. A religious doctrine is, is a bunch of bullshit you're sold. Period. Okay? Period. It's like an afterlife insurance policy. The way you buy an insurance policy on your home, on your car, on your life, all of these things. Religion is an afterlife insurance policy. End, end, end of story. That's all it is. The only way you get to know anything in this life. And the people who know something, they show it in the way they live. That's what Christ meant when he said, you'll know them by their fruit. Okay? You'll know them by their fruit. So I'm the, I'm, I'm the child of entitlement. Okay? So I pretty much made up my mind now. I'm giving up four of those late night roundtables. And we'll see if Nick picks one up, if Rectify picks one up, if uh, whomever, out, Two Feathers picks up a roundtable. You want to talk? Talk. See if you can do two hours alone and keep people listening. See if you can do it. It's, do it. it's very easy to criticize. Very, very easy to criticize. But it's actually a lot harder than you think to log on to the server and do two hours if, if nobody calls in to rebound off of. It's even harder to stay on topic when you've got three or four people because the te- everybody wants to personalize the roundtables. I don't like that, by the way. It's a public. The Greek was right when he said there's a decorum, there, there's a protocol for utilizing a public space. You're speaking to the public good. You're not calling in to bum money from people because you need 650 bucks to fix your teeth. It's absolutely shameless. I can't believe that that goes. You know what I mean? I can't believe it goes on, right? You know, and but this is all part of the beauty and charm of Revolution Radio. It's com- it's completely unstructured, unedited, and um, untampered with. 
and and you take the good with the bad, right? And and you got to dig through a lot of pig shit before you find a pearl. And 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 I guess that's the way the whole thing works out, right? So another thing I've noticed, John, is the people who want to fight the most, the people who will hurl an insult out and call you back, call you out. As soon as you stop, turn and face them and address them, they play the vic- they play the victim. Oh, Bruce is such a bully. Well, didn't you call me an mf'er on another a round table I downloaded and listened to? Well, what do you mean I'm a bully? So I should stand here and get punched in the face and not defend myself? <laughs> like, it, it's bloody ridiculous. I call you know? for, for, for every slap I give, I'll give you three, three punches to my face. Yeah, sure. That'll work out well. Yeah. And, then, and, and, then, and then there's the sensitive topics. Okay? You know, aside, uh, uh, aside from uh, Fetcho, I was one of the very first uh, hosts on this station to start sounding the alarm bell about Trump's close ties with Chad Lovitz. Oh, my God. I, I mean, I, I, Matt Avery went on the warpath. Steve Travesty went and did a YouTube video on his own personal YouTube channel citing concerns about rising anti-Semitism at Revolution Radio. And those people would still Prince. be saying, if, if, Epstein, you- if, if Epstein didn't get pinched, they'd still be saying it. Right? So... Are you people, you have a Jewish problem in the United States. They're the ones behind the white supremacy stuff. They're shoring up their utility for Trump now so the Christian right doesn't realize, and the Christian right is starting to wake up, and and, and I mean the non-Zionist Christian right, okay? And I'm not sure how that breaks down in terms of proportion in the United States, what percentage of the evangelical rectify came on air when I started talking about Jews and said I was spewing hate speech. I, I don't know how, how many times I have to repeat myself. The Torah is a God ordained book. God himself through the prophets gave the human race the Torah. It's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful culture, Jewish culture. Along comes this Christ guy. He says this thing God gave you, it's been hijacked by this priestcraft called the Pharisees. And then after the Romans finally took out the, um, the final nest of Jews there in their, um, in their clifftop uh, cave, and they all committed suicide, one got away. You know, he pleaded with the Romans to let him go start a school somewhere. He started the Talmud. The ba- he, he resurrected the Babylonian Talmud. This is all 72 AD. And then basically, Judaic has been a cult of vengeance for 2,000 years. you got to understand, if you're an Orthodox Jew and God has commanded you to repay sinners as they've sinned against you, an eye for an eye, that's not something they cannot do. By their own commandments, by their own doctrine, they have to settle all scores. So the Romans nearly killed them 2,000 years ago, were perceived as the descendants of the Roman, Romans, white Europeans, and their ancillary forces in Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and the United States. Who the hell do you think is behind the hate whitey campaign? The Zimbabweans? The Nigerians? The Chinese? Honestly, who do you think is behind this? Are the ja- is Japanese intelligence doing it? Who are you? God, I am the architect. I created the Matrix. I've been... And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, I miscued the break there. I had to get a text message uh, from somebody. So uh, this is the late night roundtable and um, Friday night, uh, 2 to 4 Eastern Standard Time, AM. I'm joined by my stalwart companion, John Z. Um, and studio, well, both studios, Studio A and Studio B, Revolution Radio is listener supported. And if you do feel inclined to support us, then I would advocate that you go to www.revolution.radio. Hit the donate button and the rest will be self-explanatory. Alternatively, you can subscribe to the archives. They're $5.95 US per month. I have them. I think most of the hosts have them. Um, I think it's well worth your investment. And um, and uh, you'll get like hours and hours of enjoyment out of that. So many good shows. And a lot of them are on at times that I'm either sleeping or uh, I don't have time to listen to them. So I download them and listen to them. And alternatively, you can go to the swag stop, shop. There's a bunch of cool stuff there to buy amongst which is a seed pack, which is the thing that I endorse the most. Now, with that said, we're going to get right back to this super funky caustic roundtable, which is getting me all kinds of messages through Facebook and Skype, by the way. Okay. Oh, jeez, oh, Johnny boy. You couldn't, uh, a lot of people are saying that long overdue, what, I, what I've uh, just said tonight. Long overdue. And um, 
But, uh, you know, that's enough of that, okay? Because, uh, you know, it's whatever. It's not fair. But uh, we'll, we'll work it out in the Revolution Radio chat. Uh, I'm going to give up for the late night roundtables. And uh, unless I'm asked to do them again, I do enjoy doing them. I don't want to give them up. But at the same time, I do believe that other people and other voices should get out there. So if somebody wants to commit and they can do a good roundtable, okay? It, 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 it's, not, it's not a 1978 Bell South party line. Where you pick up the phone and your your friend gives you two one five five, and then there's like fourteen strangers on a phone. Hey, are there any chicks here? I mean, that's what some of these roundtables sound like. There's like no topics. There's there there's nothing. It's just it's like it's not even radio. It's it, it's just like a bunch of people, uh, you know, talking around a campfire or something. Well, that even even that does it more uh, more uh, esteem than it deserves. Um, I'd throw a flashbang inside their house just to get a reaction at that point. <laughs> Yeah, but I think I think that a lot of it has to do. Um, um, yeah, here's a little comment. I won't say it's who it's from. I'm fairly alert to most people. I can imagine. Be yourself and speak your mind. The idiots soon reveal themselves. I study human behavior a lot. Thank you for that, anonymous individual listening in a faraway land. But everything's a faraway land for me, John. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I made my choices, and, you know, people can hear the happiness in my voice when I'm on the air, and that, maybe that just grinds people the wrong way. Is I, I, I can't even imagine the mounting tension in a place like Chicago or Los Angeles now. Well, actually, I can. I do have a couple friends in the L.A. area or, or Huntington Beach area, and I do talk to them, and it's, the tension is just rising and rising and rising, and now we've got this Kill Whitey campaign going, okay? Kill Whitey. And, I mean, I raised some interesting questions in the first hour. What is this love-hate relationship that people have with the white race? And who really wants to take... I don't believe that it's, it's anything more than a paper-thin mind control program, okay? And again, I think it reveals the chink in Trump's armor, is that he took a lot of Russian Jewish money to get into office. He's beholden to those people. He's given them Jerusalem. I wasn't really actually against Jerusalem. You know, I thought, okay, you know what? My first reaction to that, when I say Jerusalem, I mean... By moving the United States Embassy to Jerusalem, what Donald Trump was saying against the United Nations and international opinion is that the United Nations recognizes Jerusalem as the possession of Israel. It's no longer contested, even though the Alaska Mosque is there and all this sort of stuff, right? Now, when he did that, I said, okay, you know what? I actually, I think that's good foreign policy because it, it's, it's going to force people to react. And when you get people to react, you start a dialogue and it gets things moving. And somebody had to do something. I mean, it's been a stalemate there for I don't know how long, right? So I actually applauded the Jerusalem move. But when, when I started to see the King Cyrus coins, when I started to listen to, and even the crazy Christians have caught on now, right? They, they missed it at first. Steve Quayle was, you know, if you remember the first year of the Trump campaign, everybody thought he was a biblical figure. Now everybody kind of realizes that he's a Jew shill, right? He's, he's a Zionist shill. I shouldn't say Jew shill. That's actually a little insensitive. Again, Highest respect for the Torah and students of the Torah. The Torah is a valid spiritual path. It stands against anything in India, in China, anywhere. You know now that you mention it, one of my cousins, or both of my cousins, actually, uh, I remember when they, they did their bar mitzvah and they were reading from it, and, you know, they, they were kind of embarrassed because they messed up or something, and I was like, you know, it sounded good from here, but the overall vibe I got from that place and time where we were, it wasn't bad. It, it, it wasn't like... Um, you know, uh, going down to the, the the local mattress shop or something, or some sort of Jewish owned business. Like I get a get a weird vibe from like a lot of store Jews, owners and stuff. The Jews, the Jews have been blessed to have that kind of to create that kind of culture that that brings that kind of light, wisdom, and miracle into your life. And they did have a lot of miracles around them, eh? And I mean, that's a blessed culture. Um, but I, I'm sorry to say, they lost it. They lost their grace with God, and I think that's part of their anger now. Right? Is that they had it and they lost it. There is, no, there is wanna, nothing. You want to There's nothing in the world more bitter than a failed seeker. If you set out to yeah. find God and you fail, that is because you set that expectation so high. It, the level of bitterness if you fail or and like an abject failure. Not only did you not find God, you become a monster and a demon. Um, then it's the worst kind of life, right? Because there's a lot of pitfalls yeah. on the road, on the road to, to, to God and the grace of God in your mind and in your consciousness. There's a lot of pitfalls. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of invisible things that will try and screw you up. You have to have incredibly discipl incredible discipline in the meditative arts because 
you know, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, I, I started listening to um, some Catholic church uh, YouTubes that are coming out now about the rising incidents of possession. And, you know, they cite the usual occult stuff, Ouija boards and all this stuff. And they also say meditation, though. Meditation can get you possessed. And it's true. It, but it, it's certain kinds of meditation. And if you don't learn it properly, because meditation opens doors inside you. And just as you can go out a door, something else can come in a door. So you gotta, you, if you're going to learn meditation, you have to learn it from a real guru, from a, a path. And you have to, you have to do it cor- correctly. You have to understand mantra. And, you, you know, you, can, you can't just pick up a self-help book at uh, Barnes & Noble and start meditating. That's probably not a good idea. And, and for the first, you know, five years or so you meditate, you should have contact with some group th- that, you know, has advanced practitioners who have been meditating for 20 or 30 years. Because you, anybody who goes looking for God will meet agents of the negative side. In Christian, you call them demons and all of this. What happened to Christ in the 40 days in the desert? The, Satan himself came to Christ. Not, he knew he couldn't brace Christ tried to fear and anxiety the way he breaks down other people and possesses them. So he tried to negotiate with Christ, right? But this, the same thing happened to Milarepa. If you read the 100,000 songs of Milarepa, uh, you know, the, the, the Islamic um, mystics talk about their engagements with the negative. Uh, um, Shabrizi, Tabrizi, Rumi, they, everybody talks it. You're going to have to go. And it's a fight you have to fight. You have to stand up for yourself, right? You have to stand up for yourself and you have to do it. Um, <clears throat> okay. Okay. If you oh, okay. want to, if you want to fight a losing battle, um, fight God, and just yeah, God, God. <laughs> nobody, nobody taking the belt away from him. Nobody. God's the champ, the creator. You know, you cannot beat God, right? How did it work out for Lucifer and his and his and his one third of uh, heaven? Which, in in my cosmology, by the way, that that was either the causal or the astral plane they fell from, but they were spiritual beings. Um, Anyways, let me get into this because, you know, the, 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 although, I mean, it's been such a, a great informal conversation. Maybe we should just keep doing this, right? But um, so this white nationalism thing is rising and rising and rising and rising, right? And this is probably the most effective tool that the, um, the left and the other side has. And what I want to make people aware of is that to my sensibilities, it's not just the left pushing this. It's part of the people, the big Jewish money and the Jewish lobby that supported Trump are in on this, too. And, and as, as, as Trump's administration, and, you know, I have to give him his due. The only reason I can think that elements in Trump's camp would be telling him to admit there's white supremacy, because and, and, he pretty much did in his speech, right? And you heard the stats last Thursday night when I read the FBI's brief, right? 49 murders in 16 years, John. That's the epidemic that requires terrorism. Forty. 49 murders in 16 years. Does that sound like an epidemic to you? That 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 requires no. a terrorism? No, it doesn't. I mean, one weekend in Chicago, seven deaths and 54 shootings, and we don't know how many people are going to die. We had a weekend of chaos in Toronto as well, the same weekend as Chicago. This is why I think there's a spiritual element to it, because it has all the hallmarks of um, gematria, astrology. It's, there's no coincidence that on the same weekend, Toronto has its highest number of shootings ever, and Chicago does as well. This is why I say the devil's a, the devil is afoot in the world, right? And um, yeah, I'm going to bring somebody in. This is somebody I love very much. He's my favorite Christian at the station. Do you want to come in before I say your name? Because if you do, I'll bring you in. You're my favorite Christian at the station because you speak about the grace of God in a universal way. Um, but then I'm going to get jealousy from the people who wanted to come in. Um, I'll let him. I'll let him. I'll let him text. Um, but this is the big card they're going to play now, right? And it's it's very interesting that it's being played right at this juncture, you know, a year and a half before we go into the next election. And, and Trump's not coping with it well, but his side doesn't have a really good strategy. And the reason for that is he's surrounded himself with these Chablovitz nut bars, right? Breitbart is an Israeli operation, folks. I mean, that's a, that should be as plain as the nose on your face. The level of his, Israeli involvement. In American media and politics is outrageous now. If it were anyone but the Jews, you'd be chasing them out of it, okay? If the Irish controlled (laughs) American uh, media and politics to this degree, you'd be talking about it. If the Armenians controlled American politics and media to this degree, you know, and I'm just going to say it, this is going to piss off a lot of people. I totally agree with Iran 
Omar when she says it's all the, one of the problems in America is the stranglehold on American politics that the Jews have. And she's absolutely right. It's all about the Benjamins. It's not it, it, it's got nothing to do with morality, folks. Do you think these people in Congress are moral? That it, it's by moral disposition that they're in favor of, of Israel? No. Their pictures exist of their penis exposed in the presence of a child under 10, or they've taken a bag of cash and signed the Cynthia McKinney contract. Right? It's, it's one of those two things. And you need, you need to address this because people are trying to kill you. Okay? If you, hear, if you hear a bullet whiz past your ears, hey, is that a bullet? No, duck! Duck! I've done that. <laughs> What do, you, what do you do when danger is around you, Joe? What do you do? Do you have a polite debate about it because you don't want to offend the people who are shooting at you? Well, I do think there's somebody shooting at us. Hey, wait, wait. You know, it's kind of like that Tweety Bird. Hey, that, look, that sounded like a bullet. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. It is a bullet. <laughs> it, it, it's a bullet, yeah. And uh, we've been joined by my friend and a great friend of the station and a fellow host coming back, I believe, first week in September to take up the mantle of the unequivocal truth again, the incomparable John Wayne. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting to see how there's this tension, and you can almost cut it with a knife. I mean, even a butter knife at that, a very mm -hmm. dull knife. And seeing how they've been playing this card, I had that question. I asked somebody this a while ago today. How come they didn't pull this under the reign of Barack Hussein Obama? Because if there was any presidency that would have gotten this pushed through as hard as they're pushing it now, it would have been under that presidency. Well, maybe um, they w were worried that they would provoke a white backlash against Obama. Now, it's, that's not good optics, a black man taking away malicious weapons, right? So maybe, yeah, but they, they are, yeah. Why did, uh, I, that's the only thing that comes to mind. I'm not sure it's a suitable answer. I'll stop now. Go ahead, John. Well, you know, they've got these, uh, these uh, the situation that, took place uh, yesterday afternoon. This man, I guess that's what we'll call him, a kid, I guess, 20 years old, uh, films himself walking into a Walmart with a, you know, AR platform type weapon strewn across the front of him, a flak vest, 100 rounds on him. You know, this guy looks like this was a complete operation set up to be able to pull this and push the narrative even further. And there's another thing I come across. A man in Florida walked into a Walmart and said that he wanted anything that would kill a 200 people. Hmm. So, you know, they're using this, and they're pushing this narrative. And I just yeah. pray to God that they're not able to make something happen along this line. I mean, we know they want a civil war. You know they want complete chaos, disruption. We know that's what they want, and we well, can't give it to them. Let, let's, let's, let's just look at the fate of, and again, I don't know if you listened to the first hour, but I said for a people that are supposed to be so evil, the white race, a lot of people want to be like us, and a lot of people want to live with us. The number one cosmetic surgery in South Korea is rounding the eyes. Japanese animation called anime, is it called, John, or anime? Um, they, also, they also round the eyes. They're, they want to look like white people. They want to look like Caucasians. Um, the only civilizations, is people, I, I sometimes, there's this thing going on now amongst the pro progressive crowd about w why do white people call themselves expats and why does anybody who goes to a white society get called an immigrant? <laughs> the simple answer is everybody's going to white societies, right? I mean, that's a good question. Yeah, that's just, a, I've never thought of that. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So. People want to live in white Christian societies. Let's be honest. They want to live in Italy. They want to live in France. They want to live in Germany. They want to live in Britain. They want to live in Canada. They want to live in the United States. They want to live in Australia. They want to live in New Zealand. There's no other place in the world people are emigrating to. People may go and live in Dubai or Saudi Arabia for two or three years to make money, but they come home, right? But nobody else, nobody else attracts people like our societies. And so, and I do agree with Donald Trump, although I, I agree with Iran Omran when she talks about the Jewish lobby, but I don't agree with her socialist outlook and everything. And I agree with Trump when he says to her, if you don't like it, go home. And and he's out, and there's nothing racist about that. All he's trying to do is create a baseline of commitment to the United States so that if you even want to enter the debate, you first of all have to believe that the United States isn't a bad place and you're happy to be there. And if you're there and you, do, and you weren't born there, why did you immigrate there if all you wanted to do was criticize it? Like it, it's, it's bloody ridiculous. And nobody is standing up for us. And it's not just the you United States. Something funny, Bruce? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I've been around New York quite some time. You know, I've grown up here pretty much. Um, 
you know, besides being out of country for a couple of years and stuff like that. But um, I find that uh, you're going to laugh at this. Uh, some of the gas stations, some of the delis are more American and they're first generation immigrants than, yeah. than most Americans. You cannot believe the shit people, these people take on a daily basis from just ignorant, dumb, entitled 20 something year olds. I, I remember there was like, it had to have been like a month and a half ago by now. Just, I, you know, same place I always go to get gas and, you know, whatever. I walk in and there, there's a screen, this, guy, this white kid is screaming at the store clerk who I've known for years through multiple stores at this point. He just happens to own a gas station at this point. And this kid is screaming about him, about like something like some coffee additives that they cost a dollar or something. And it, 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 you know, the owner is saying, like, look, just tell me if you don't have the money. And this kid just keeps going on and on and on. And like I'm sitting, like I'm standing there behind him, like, you know, waiting now at this point. And I'm just like, oh, you know, like I really want to hit him in the face, you know, but I can't do that. <laughs> you know, it just it's so ridiculous. Yeah. The thing is there, you know, you mentioned the word entitled. And yeah, that's a good word. But I think a better word is indoctrinated. They yes. indoctrinated by programmed. The, yeah, absolutely programmed. I mean, there's many ways for programming, not only the uh, public school systems or the indoctrination camps is what I call them. But, you know, there's actual patents that I've come across that shows that there's neural manipulation through screen time. Absolutely. Through your smartphones, absolutely. TV, your tablets. And, the, you know, the, and let's not only think about them forms of indoctrination. Think of, um, you know, and I've mentioned it several different times. When a child's born in a modern-day hospital in the West, they are completely and utterly inundated with EMF frequencies, electromagnetic, electromagnetic yes, frequencies. Yes, they are. It, it has to do with the baby alarms they claim they are, whatever it is, and they're always going off and... Oh, I mean, stuff. besides the baby alarms, I mean, you know, they've got everything is electronic now. Yeah. Everything. And all of these things tied together is a perfect catalyst for everything we're seeing right now. And I believe that this also ties into with, you know, what we're seeing with this demonic infestation. You know, this guy that went on an yeah. absolute stabbing spree in uh, uh, California, Southern California, yeah. here two days ago. You know, and the police chief, given his, uh, his uh, well, his uh, address to the situation, mm-hmm. said, this is the most evil thing that I've ever seen in my entire life. This is just pure evil. That's, that's all he could say. This is evil, evil, evil. Nothing else yeah. other than just pure evil. Manifestation yeah. of evil. Yeah, we're, we're, we, I agree, John. And this is where the Christians come in uh, very handy. They're, this is the area of specialty with the, Christian, with the Christians is, is cleanliness of, um, of mind and spirit. And if you don't do that... Yeah, there, I don't know what's going on. Like, I, I'm not an astrologer or anything like that. I, I'm just an excellent observer is what I am. Combination of meditation, a journalism degree, and a bunch of things. And I am telling you, I have never in my life seen so many spiritually disturbed people. And I, I go back to the movie The Exorcist in 1972. That's a tremendous disservice because it characterizes it in a way that it, that kind of possession is once every 300 years, maybe, okay? But most people who are spiritually bothered, it's like, it's not a demon per se, but it's someone who's not in a good place after they died, okay? And th- it can be something as little as um, people want to enjoy tobacco. They, they, they used to smoke a pipe when they were alive 100 years ago, and they'll attach themselves to somebody who smokes a pipe. A lot of alcoholics have entities attached to them. Now, th- this has been going on for a long, long time, but what's happening now is wherever these entities live, there's a disturbance in their world that seems to be panicking them, is how I would put it, right? And you you know, know, they, know, they know their time is short. The veil's uh, being ripped as we speak. Yeah. And I listened to Stan Deo the other night. He was on the Hagman Report with Doug Hagman. And he uh, gave an excellent illustration for how our world collides with these lower entities or these lower realms and even the higher realms of what you might, may call heaven or, you know, Shangri-La, Nirvana, whatever it may be. Yeah. And he, he was saying that the higher realms are at a wider frequency for atomic uh, structure. We're on a substructure, and I mean our atomical structure for what we see, like we, you know, let's say the dresser in front of me, the uh, TV, on the wall, the, you know, our our physical being, yeah, is on a certain an- anatomical structure. The lower anatomical structure is even smaller and closer spaced, and these yeah. waves they move through each other as time goes by. You know, I mean, you can look at the Dark Ages up until the Renaissance, and so on and so forth. And we're coming into another one of those um, in times in space and time. 
the entanglement, I guess we could call it, where we are literally moving through each of these realms, and the he- the heavenly realms are even getting closer. And that's therefore, like you said, that's why these entities are freaking the hell out and trying to do as much carnage, chaos, damage as they can because they know their time is short. Yeah, I would agree. The time is at hand. Thank Something. You. Go ahead, John. I, I think another reason why people in general are freaking out is because you're not you're not able to hide from stuff on a subconscious level. I just think now that it's coming into the forefront of people's you know minds and, and they're they're able to see it now. And you know, one of the things about this reality is once something is shown to you, you can't forget it. It's there forever. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So th- these are going to be very trying times, and um, a lot of people have had their spiritual defense stripped from them through the kind of culture we created in North America from the 1950s onward, the, destru- the, the destruction of spiritual culture. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying these institutions are perfect. I mean, the Catholic Church has been infiltrated by very dark forces. That, you know, there's no doubt about it. Um, I believe all religions have. Every single religion yeah. that you may call it, it has been infiltrated, turned into right. debauchery. I'm about and- to do something I might regret here. I'm bringing Hijacker in. Jacker, if we're if in 15 minutes we're on flat Earth, I'm dropping you. Okay, end of story, man. I just fit into the conversation. Okay, talk about what we're talking about: white extremism and the rising sort of bad spirit or entity manipulation of human beings on the Earth right now. Now, my two co-hosts for this roundtable, John and John, are you okay with me making this decision to bring Hijacker in? Oh, absolutely. I'm not. I have no yeah. problem with anybody. All right, he's like, the most, you know, one of the most like dynamic guys on the station, and he dro- he jacks the numbers all up. But uh, people love the jacker, so here he is, Jacker. I'm bringing you in. Are you ready? I'm about to hit the button now. Three, two, one, add. And, and it's gone. And the jacker is being dialed. He'll be in any minute now. Bruce, can I say something here real quick before we jump off into anything yeah. else? Um, something people need to be aware of is something that took place in 2017. I covered it in depthly, and it involves a substance or a a, a uh, anatomical structure called urethium uh, 106, urethrinium 106. Mm-hmm. Now, the Russians had a major uh, disaster back in 2017. Nobody knows what it is or what it was, and it um, raised the radioactive levels in uh, all throughout Europe. Mm-hmm. Now, we've got another you know, evolving situation that occurred within the past two days. Mm-hmm. There's been another nuclear disaster in Russia, and the Russians in the north are uh, scrambling to go and purchase iodine. And from what I've heard is not only was there this disaster that took place two days ago, but there was one that took place just yesterday as well. Oh, my God. You think it's sabotage or accident? Yeah, no, I don't know. Um, it's really something else. They're saying it was caused from a failed missile launch, which was using a liquid fuel that was somehow um, boosted with uh, an atomical or atomical energy. Okay. Some extent. There's one other thing I, I want to say before I turn it over to Hijacker, and that is that, let's not forget, I mean, I always, just as a mental default, go to gematria and astrology for the time we're living in for all of the sort of spiritual disturbances, but let's not forget that Satanism is on the rise and they're invoking these spirits. This is being done intentionally. They're being invoked. What do you think happens when you put up a statue to Baphomet, right? You're invoking. So these things are being invoked. It's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual war. And here's a general, the hijacker. Jacker, you're on. No, you're right. It is a spiritual war. That's why they, the um, sigils, you probably know something about that. And yeah. the way they build like Washington, D.C., like a pentagram. And so there is a, there's a magical element to to all of this, and and the Christians really don't understand a lot of that. Uh, I'll have to be honest with you, yeah. how it exactly works. But you're basically talking about white nationalism, but what you're really talking about, Bruce, is what makes good radio. And um, I may be a little host, and I may not have very many people to listen to me, but I do know something about it. And yeah. what makes good radio, uh, it's down to two things, really. Um, one, uh, probably the most important thing, especially in the genre that we're in, an alternative talk or truthers, you know, that type of thing, is um, must listen to. So if you can always put, like before you do your show, what's a must listen to show, uh, a show that people have to listen to because it's important. Like uh, John Wayne talked about Stan Dale. Now he used to be a must listen to for me, but something else came up, which, which derailed that and I realized, wait a minute, this guy's a hardcore Christian Zionist, among other things. But 
that's my point. The second thing that is um, uh, for good radio, must listen to, and it's about the most important thing that you could talk about uh, at this particular time. And so that's why you got the numbers you got now, Bruce, is because you're talking about uh, the, the, the thing that's most important right now, which is the I'll, rival. I'll, how do you do that? How do you know the numbers? I, I always assume like eight people are listening to me. You're gonna, you're gonna, you know what you're going to do if you keep telling me this? I'm going to become like a high steel worker who loses his nerve. I'm going to look down. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll put in – I'll just go ahead and send you the Skype where you okay. can go. And now this particular site, this will only give you like one-tenth of one percent. But the, okay. reason, the reason why you can trust these numbers um, uh, is because I have actually watched it not only with Revolution Radio but other stations – and even though it's a small, small sample, it's very mm -hmm. scientific. I mean, very. So, what uh, what kind of numbers am I pulling in? Five hundred. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, Nock, uh, Nighthawk would actually have the real numbers, but you're you're dealing with one tenth of one percent. This is like, and you can go on the internet. Go type in like internet. No, ballpark. Ballpark. What what kind of numbers are we looking at here? Ballpark. Well, let me put it this way. Right now, you're pulling uh, about – so Deacon's show is actually the um, the biggest show, according to these numbers. You would be – and it's hard for me to believe, and I keep watching it at night. I don't know how it works because you got to realize uh, the timeline, the time space that, that Deacon's on, that's drive time. That's like 200 million Americans on the East Coast yeah. getting off work. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But no, no, you, you're, you're pulling uh, about two-thirds of that, and – uh, overall, your your show at night, when you're on, I've noticed, it is like the third or fourth biggest show on Revolution Radio. Oh, okay. Well, that's nice to know. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, it's nice yeah, to know it's not in vain. Right, Bruce. If you're you're natural, if you ever decided to go, like, mainstream and do, like, I'm a five-day-a-week type thing in, in a certain... Who's going to pick up a Canadian for mainstream? I'm done tech writing. I want a job in broadcasting, man. I'll tell I'll tell people whatever you tell me to tell them if you pay me well. <laughs> I'm Rodney. Right. But I'm saying if you if you were to because of the kind of the kind of topics and content that yeah. you traffic in, uh, it's very popular. So if you okay. actually got a spot like near Deacon John's spot, uh, and it was five days a week, the consistency, you yeah. would draw a big audience. You would you would be a natural yeah. Bruce. Really. So I'm gonna try I'm gonna try and finish the topic. I couldn't finish the night you brought it up, Hijacker, because it's on topic with what we're talking about tonight. And I was interrupted twice, and I took it as a sign. I'm going to try now, okay? And now, if anything goes wrong, I lose my internet or something, I'm not going to talk about it. So the third temple, for those of you who are familiar with the model of the Hegelian dialectic as given to us by David Icke, okay? So it's problem, reaction, solution. He says this is how the Masonic, Kabbalistic, Deep State, whatever you want to call them, Illuminati, I don't care what title you give them, but you'd have to be a moron to be living in this world and not come to the conclusion that there's a controlling and directing force that is not following the will of people in so-called free societies, okay? So whatever name you give to them, okay, their principal trick is problem, reaction, solution. They, and But they create all three stages. This is why they fund ISIS. This is why they fund Al-Qaeda. This is why Israel created Hamas, to gain internet. It's sympathy magic. OK, if you can open up people's hearts and make them feel sorry for you, you're going to get them. Cause that's a highly suggestive state. And any idea that follows the emotion, they're going to agree with. It's almost like a sales trick. Right. So this is the Hegelian dialectic. It's used all the time. The third temple is a, is is probably the, the first two dimensional Hegelian dialectic we're going to witness in our lives, where it's not just geopolitical where it's not just get suckering people into World War II or this or that. This one is going to bone... The problem that is now is the, is the rising presence of bad spirit in the world, and the solution is going to be the rabbinical councils because they can make it all go away. Okay? But the, the, and so who's creating the problem? This, it's a Hegelian dialectic, okay? They're creating the problem, or they're aware of it and not serving humanity correctly, but actually using it to further their own personal goals of entitlement, power, and control over the world, despite the fact that they're a very small minority in the world. So that's what's going on with the third temple. And you go back to your scripture, and you realize that Solomon had this ring, and he was able to get demons to work for him. This comes up in Islamic scripture as well. There have been sheikhs that have been able to uh, command jinn. And I don't know where the jinn fit into the cosmology, if they're the same as whatever they are. The Muslims told me the jinn are made of fire. Man, God made man, and God made the jinn. Okay, he made the jinn as they are. They're not fallen. 
Okay, so the jinn are made from fire and man is made from clay. But <clears throat> there are stories about advanced shakes and 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 remember, advanced consciousness people, unless they're in complete surrender to God, they can be a great benefit to humanity or they can be a dark sorcerer from any path. I remind people that Milarepa started out as a black magician. He called in a hailstorm and killed 40 members of his own family, okay, through black magic. Repented, took his vows, became a renunciate, meditated, became a saint. And um, so this is what I think is going on with the Third Temple, okay? It's a Hegelian dialectic, okay? And as far if you're not talking about the Jews right now, no matter who you are, you, in my opinion, you do not have a clue what's going on in this world. You don't. You just you're can't see it. And put, you're setting, drawing, and pushing the narrative. And, you know, I'd like to know who's um, who's raising the, the little den of fox over there. You know, I don't know if you guys have seen that or not. But what, sorry, sorry, say that again? Uh, den of fox. Uh, What's that? Some, something I'd, well, a den of fox. Oh, den of fox. fox. Yeah, de, fox live in a den. And, you know, I'd never heard of this before, ever in my entire life. And then the other day I was sitting there going through some news. And they're saying <clears throat> something in the... I think it may be the Talmud. I don't know. It may not be the Talmud. I'd have to look at the, find the article and pull it up. But the thing is, um, there's fox that are showing up all around the Temple Mount, running around playing, you know, being fox, doing what they do. And supposedly, that is some form of prophecy in Judaism. So I'd like to know who's uh, raising the fox and turning them loose, just to say. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, uh, anyway, so foxes were always kind of like a, a kind of a Japanese thing for a long time. Uh, that's kind of weird. Yeah, in in Buddhism, a fox is a female seductress, and it's it's an in spirit form. They come as a fox, and it's considered a very bad very bad sign. And uh, you know, the the Buddhists say that if you get tangled up with one, it's another ten thousand years of incarnation. Right in the Buddhist world, all the penalties are more life, more more incarnation. It's very funny the way it works. Thank, thank God I'm not Buddhist, then, because I saved three baby fox out of a cistern that was thirty feet in the ground about well six or seven years ago. So that's good. Okay, all right. So, um, um, yeah, well, that's interesting. So, anyways, this is what I see. So, the major tactic we have to deal with now is this white supremacy thing, and the number one thing is you can't get angry. Because the moment you get angry, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're an angry white person. Hey, you're an angry white person. But as you look, uh, as your eyes are open and you look objecti- objectively, you realize that there's absolutely no substance to this claim. Again, I'll go over the primary statistics. The statistics used in the bill before the Senate um, is, um, uh, or, or in the FBI report and the bill to get uh, this terrorism designation. Uh, I think it's bill Senate Bill 289. I think. But uh, they really want to get this through, and I, and I see Trump waffling on this, okay? Um, 49 deaths related to, like, neo-Nazis, Ku Klux Klan, or anyone that you could put under the white supremacist umbrella. 49 deaths in 16 years, compared to 54 deaths, or 54 shootings and 7 deaths that we know of. There may be more now, people who didn't make it out of critical care in the hospital. 54 shootings in one weekend in, um, in Chicago due to black gang violence. 17 shootings include, I don't know how many fatalities, same weekend in Toronto, all related to gang violence. And the Toronto Star, our liberal socialist newspaper, talked about throwing more money at this. And I put a comment under the newspaper story. I said, maybe we can put a gang tax on top of the carbon tax, on top of the excise tax that sits on the liter of gas. Would that solve it? Oh, my God. I got like a, oh, like 150 likes on this. So, Pete, this is another thing that bolsters my, that I, I think that the mainstream media is a paper tiger, that they, they appear to be pe- speaking for the American people, but they're not. When you actually go to any of these news outlets and you do battle in the comment section, and I do a lot of time in there during the day if I'm reading some, I'll, not a lot of time, but I'll dart over to Facebook. My Facebook is a news feed, by the way. I don't use, I, I have friends, but I don't communicate with uh, friends a lot. I use it to read the New York Times for free, all my favorite newspapers from all over the world, okay? And I go in there and I do battle in the comment section. And what I'm seeing is I'm not getting shouted down by vast numbers. I'm getting all kinds of people. I'll, you'll get the usual comments like tinfoil hat and this and that. And then what I'm seeing now in numbers that are about seven or ten to one, 
people on the same page as me will come in and defend me and put their own comments in. And it, 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 this is why I think that the, the, the Trump movement is real. And this is why him caving into white nationalism worries me a little bit. And the only reason I can think he can do it is that the, his handlers may be worried that the Christians might balk at a war with Iran. So I'm, I'm right back to your theory, hijacker. You may be on the right path here. It would be horrible, and almost, America would have no credibility in the world if they attack another Muslim country, okay? There were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Syria didn't do anything to deserve the beating we laid on them. Libya didn't deserve what we did to them, not Middle East per se, but Northern Africa there, but the same sort of thing, you know. We're sitting by and allowing starvation and horrible, horrible death to befall children and all kinds of people in Yemen because we do not have the balls to stand up to Saudi Arabia, like you, you have to be moral in this world, whether you're an individual or a country. You have to be moral. And if you're not moral, your immorality will come back to haunt you. In my, in my theology, I call it karma. In Newtonian physics, you call it action-reaction. But it, physics only deals with physical stuff. But you got to, as we get into these subtler planes, we're talking about spirits and everything, okay? Everything you do goes out with a signature that's registered to you. And it, that's how it knows to come back to you. You cannot fool it. And, and, and I think the world's tolerance for the U.S.'s nonsense would be an attack on Iran. And before I yield the mic, I'll say one more thing. Despite all the talk about Trump being a, a dictator and a tyrant and all the nonsense they throw at this man, he has almost no, maybe even to my knowledge, no blood on his hands yet from a war. Not unlike Obama, who killed over a million civilians in the Middle East, a million innocent Muslim people. Iran Omar, Omar calls him out on that. She said he was not a friend of the Muslim people, and he got away with what he got away with because he was a pretty face, and the liberals liked him. Um, Janie, Jacker, Janie, Janie, you're Remember good. This? Jacker, Jacker's up. Jacker's up. Go, Jacker. Bruce, you're going to like this story about karma. Um, this is pretty good. In fact, you can actually go, and it's on it's on YouTube. It's called, I think, Instant Karma. So it's, it happens in Canada. It's a hockey game. I don't know if you've ever saw it, but uh, so the the you know the guys are doing it with the sticks or whatever. Anyway, somehow a stick ends up hitting this guy in the right eye. Uh, got through his mask, or maybe it was a puck. Yeah, it was a puck. Got shot up and actually hit him in the eye and actually cut it, and he was bleeding. One of the opposing fans uh, of, of the other hockey team, you could see him behind the glass a little ways up, and he was just laughing. He thought that was the funniest thing. That this guy had gotten a, a hockey puck right above the, the the right eye, and so the next thing, okay, so they do the slap off or whatever. I don't know how hockey goes, but the very next exchange, within like thirty seconds, this puck ends up flying uh, through the glass or past the glass, right at the level he was at, and hit him in the exact same eye. <laughs> wow! And, uh, talk about talk about instant karma. Uh, that was really something for the books. I mean, it all happened like within just a minute or so. But you, uh, uh, for this guy to take such joy in a human being getting so damaged, and then the exact thing he's laughing about happens to him like within a minute or so. You uh, sow yeah, the wind. Go ahead. You sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. And we're coming near, we got about 12 minutes left, but I want to remind people that, um, so I'm giving up four late night round tables, hijacker. If you want one, it's all yours. If it's if it's if for the first yeah, don't do it, Bruce. Don't don't. Well, I got a lot of people, a lot of people complaining that Rev Radio is all Bruce now. They don't seem to like it, so I got to do the right thing here, hijacker. I, I they don't, don't know, know how much man. energy it takes, people. They don't they're have a clue. They're not going to do it, and, do it. Yeah. Do it Bruce. They're, you're well, right. Let, let them do. try. Let them kill the slot in terms of numbers and people calling in. And then I'll step in and take it over again. But I can't say I told you so until I give them an opportunity to try. So if anybody wants a roundtable, either contact management at Rev Radio, or, and if you don't know who that is, go through the person you usually deal with or the, or the show that you go on consistently. So for Nick in Winnipeg, call Noreen, and Noreen will put you in contact with, um, with management, and you can get a roundtable. Rectify, I see you're back on the host chat. Grab a roundtable, man. Tell me what night you want and do a roundtable, okay? Anybody else wants a roundtable? There's four to go. I'm only keeping my Sunday night show and Olive Branch um, for Michael Olivero. And that's it. Unless they don't get filled, and then I'll continue to do them. And even if I do get full-time work in California, they're two hours behind me, so I don't have to get up till 11 in the morning to make a 9 o'clock start time with them so I can continue to do the roundtables. But if anybody thinks that they're not getting enough time to say what they need to say and they have something really important that the world needs to hear, here's your chance. 
Become active. Stop being reactive. Do it. Do it. Do it. And quit whining because I am sick of your whining. Over. Something I got here, um, hopefully it's not true, but um, this is saying, I mean, you know, for granted, you know, grain of salt here, or grain of sand, whichever the euphemism is, on uh, beforeitsnews.com. I go here and I read I think, a few things here and there, you know, and some of it seems to be valid, some of it seems to be, you know, a lot of focus focus, but this here says, um, in fact, the Antichrist will be introduced to the world on November 21st of 2019. Hmm. So I don't know. I'm just saw that. We're going to throw it out there. Another thing is, uh, you know, I watched this video where this guy was do, uh, going through all this uh, geometria and uh, numerology. And he was saying the 11th of this month here in just a couple of days could prove to be um, something absolutely horrid to come upon this country. And he was going through all kinds of uh, ways that they use this 811, and they put it in a bunch of different shows, movies, and things to this effect. And not only that, but how certain birthdays with leaders of this country come up with this number 811. So I don't know. Just something to say. Thinking about it, you know. I think I think this month is pretty ripe for another big event, too. They like August, and they like early September, right? There's something about that, and their astrology on the other side. And... Um, you know, so I'm. I would expect something, and I think I think I listened to that three and a half minute uh, clip you put in host chat from Bill Cooper, and I agree with you. I think it's going to be the Midwest this time. Or was was he referring to Timothy McVeigh there, the Oklahoma bomber? When but he said that after McVeigh, that was like ninety seven. That clip, right? The Bill yeah, Cooper Mc, clip. Yeah, McVeigh would have been ninety five, and the Bill Cooper clip was ninety seven. Well, for all we know, the flooding could be the terrorist act, right? But, I mean, you guys, I say this all the time, and I say it to Jacker especially, because his his mind is attuned to look for conflict outside of the U.S. borders, and I'm constantly trying to remind him, Jacker, look at what's going on. Those fires aren't natural in California. That flooding in the Midwest is not natural. Your crop is being taken. You're not going to have corn, which is the foundation of the American diet. You're, you're not going to have a whole bunch of food. Food prices are going to go through the roof. This is all economic, strategic warfare. No, it's going through the roof, Bruce. I'm up here, Western Washington. I'm at the foot of the Cascades. Basically, a green bell pepper goes for a dollar. Uh, a, a, a cauliflower head is like three thirty nine a pound. Are you, Jeff, are you fighting any? Are you fighting any corn up that way in your grocery stores by chance? Any what? Corn, uh, maize no, goes about a buck a year. Uh, the cauliflower head, when I weighed it out. It was close to four pounds, so that would have been like twelve dollars for one wow. cauliflower head. Now it was a big one, but still, that would have been twelve bucks. That's but, like caviar, right? right. So, That's ridiculous. Oh, it, of course. Uh, so think about, um, you know, the pound of ground beef. You know, usually it's like four or five bucks. The grass fed up here, I can get. I've got a spot where I can get the grass fed for like five bucks a pound. But to take a head of cauliflower and you know to turn it into twelve dollars. Three dollars and thirty nine cents a pound, mm -hmm. just like, and that, uh, but all the prices, I couldn't believe it. A cucumber, buck fifty. Um, yeah, I don't want to make you guys. I don't want to make you guys jealous, but I can't even finish the fruit from my girlfriend's family's land. My fruit trees aren't even in yet, except for my bananas. But I have fruit here all the time. I'm throwing out avocado and mango because I can't. Uh, eat, I, I can't eat it all because it's so bad. Uh, what's that? Those onions are pretty amazing over there. Let me tell you. Yeah, the onions are good too, but they're, they're, you know, but I, I got so much fresh, fr um, organic fruit to eat here free. It's unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. Yeah, the point of the story, though, Bruce, is that you're right. Um, the food prices are going up. Yeah. We're not going to suffer, but we're going to pay through the nose. So you can imagine the poor of the world. Uh, they're the ones that are going to get, you know, because the prices are going to go up. It's so supply and demand, so to speak. So you're going to see people on the edges of society in places like Africa uh, and Asia. Uh, they're really going to have a tough time. Um, yeah, yep. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even go that far away. I'd look at the streets of Los Angeles, uh, the streets of Detroit, the streets of uh, you know Philadelphia, Cincinnati, That's Ohio. Cool. All of these streets of uh, where all these homeless people are literally living in tent cities. You don't even have to go that far away. Just look that just look that close. You know, another thing I want to put out there is if people want to see the real situation that's unfolding across not only the world in this country, all you got to do is go to LiveLeak dot com. You go to LiveLeak.com, and you see all the videos on there from police murders, you know, literally gunning people down in the streets, um, beating women in jail cells to, you know, I mean, just everything. Just go yeah. to that site and take a look. It's all right there for everybody to see. Wrap yeah, it up. Just, 
Final thoughts. Wrap her up, boys. Wrap her up. If you wanted to do some overtime, I'd hang, but I'm not going to hang out myself. Jerry Bear is doing his after hour show starting uh, right at the top of the hour. Oh, I see. see. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, well, I I guess if Bruce is signing off, I mean, I don't know how much I'm going to jump on. Hold on. It's, It's conditional. People, people have to request the slots. They're open if you want them. And we're going to see who steps forward and maintains commitment for like six months and actually builds a show and builds a caller base and keeps at it, okay? They're not even going to do it, Bruce. They're not even going to do it. You know what, and I know it, because their nature is to complain but not do anything. Well, no, Bruce, listen, you and I both know how hard it is, how much information you have to have. Yeah. I mean, it's not an easy thing. No. It's not easy. It's no, not easy. I, I can do, do it like by the hours by myself. It's, it's right. like it's like drinking. It's like eating rat poison every day, for getting this stuff out of your system. Now it's so toxic to think about this stuff. I gotta I gotta like meditate and pray a couple hours a day just to like stay sane. Well, right? That's why I'm not gonna pick up. That's why I'm not gonna pick up any round tables. I'm gonna be doing good enough just to do my show, get my guests together, and cover all the absolute horrific, horrendous things that you know needs to be talked about. Yeah, and you got a must listen to. Uh, uh, you got a must listen to show too, John. You're, 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 you're like one of the top two or three. I mean, you got good night. Oh yeah, I yeah, know. I usually sit between must uh, listen to fifteenth on uh, Talk Stream Live. Well, there's a break, guys. So. Okay, good night, folks. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to donate. Another great roundtable. Good night, John D. Good night, Hijacker. Good night, John Wayne. All right, Carlos. Welcome to Revolution Radio, where you, the listeners, are in charge. Here at Revolution Radio, we present 48 broadcast hours of news and information each and every day. Revolution Radio never sleeps. Revolution Radio is worldwide and borderless information. Revolution Radio is also commercial free. Revolution Radio is supported 100% by you, the listeners. And that's why we appeal to you to donate and support this station and its expenses. You can support us in many available options like archive subscriptions, our seed pack selections, or even my woodworking store. And we also even have Revolution Radio's swag at the Revolution Radio Zazzle store once you can get t-shirts, coffee cups, even a baby onesie. Or you can just plain donate to the cause. We cannot continue without your support, and your support is what helps pay the bills. So please, if you wish us to continue, please stop by our station support page and drop a dime on us. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? Is survival and gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. Over 3 gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a mega virus or a computer failure took out your bank, or all the banks for that matter. Are your banking records safe in your hands so when they get things fixed and repaired, you can say, hey, look, this is what I had. You have it. I want it back. Is your personal data safe? Family records? Addresses? Phone numbers? Well, squeeze on over to freedomslips.com. Yes, that's www.freedomslips.com Click the banner on the homepage for the EMP proof bullet drive to get the full scoop of everything that we offer. So folks, keep your data safe for your peace of mind. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com You don't need to expect us. We're already here. This is the people's war. It is our war. We are the fighters. Fight it then. Fight it with all that is in us. May God defend the right. Warning! Warning! We gotta stop us! They're gonna kill us all! The other cover you started? Be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings! When the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part, you can't even passively take part, and you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop! You guys are to take the people who run it, the people who own it, and unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Revolution Radio.
Radio at freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported talk radio station, throwing ourselves upon the gears of the machine. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. You called down the thunder, well, now you've got it. Right. You tell them I'm coming, and hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me! Revolution Radio. Extendivite really works. Just listen to what some people have to say. Several years ago, I was developing a very uh, severe situation. I called it my flippy heart. It just was doing not good things. And I did not want to go to a medical doctor because uh, I just knew they would give me a cover-up pill. I didn't want to get onto that sort of thing at all. When I learned it was garlic and cayenne, and cayenne is a healer. It is a wonderful herb. I said, I think I'm onto something here. I'll tell you, I wouldn't be without it. It did wonderful things for me. Extendivite is only $69.95 for a two-month supply of either capsules or liquid. Call now. That's 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily...